Hello, I'm Matthew Jarron, museum curator at the University of Dundee, and welcome to the latest in a series of short films in which I talk about some of the highlights of the University Museum collections. And today we're taking another look at the Darcy Thompson Zoology Museum, and in particular we're going to explore how this extraordinary collection developed. You probably know that what we have now is just a small part of Darcy's original collection, which, before the building was demolished in 1957, was one of the largest natural history collections of its kind anywhere in the country. Darcy came to Dundee in 1885 to take up the first chair of biology at what was then University College Dundee, and he quickly realised that what he needed to teach his students was a museum containing representatives of all the principal groups of organisms. At the time, there was no such facility in Dundee, the collections in the Albert Institute, what's now the McManus, being dismissed by Darcy as devoid of any educational value. So the museum was really a priority for him right from the start, and in his first annual report he noted, "...considerable progress has been made towards the creation of a museum. About 600 bottles of permanent specimens have been prepared by me, and some rare and valuable ones have been purchased." Various individual donors were persuaded to provide funds to support this endeavour, including James Martin White, who would later go on to endow Patrick Geddes's chair of botany. At that time, however, there was little space to display specimens, and storage was a major problem. Having filled his own rooms in the Natural History Building, Darcy was soon borrowing space from many of the other departments, including, interestingly, a room in the basement of the Chemistry Laboratory, which of course is where the current version of the museum is today. Finally, in 1893, an extension was built onto Darcy's building, which allowed space for the creation of a proper museum, which would ultimately occupy the first and second floors of the building, with stores in the basement and further specimens in the junior laboratory. The trustees of the late Margaret Harris, who also endowed the Chair of Physics at the University, provided money to buy display cases. In seeking to build up a collection, Darcy sought the advice of the celebrated English biologist Thomas Huxley, who replied, "'In heaven's name, don't go in for mummies and Polynesian paddles. Your museum ought to be three things. One, a teaching collection. Two, Dundee fauna, flora and anthropology. Three, things having special interest for Dundee, or more easily obtained there than elsewhere.'" Well, Darcy largely stuck to points one and three, the second being the concern of the City Museum and the Albert Institute. Writing to his grandfather in October 1885, he noted, "'Additions to my museum are numerous. Within the last week I have had a porpoise, two mongooses, a small shark, an eel eight foot long, a young ostrich, and two bagfuls of monkeys. All dead, of course.'" Darcy's strategy was to collect as many specimens as he could, some of which he would keep for the museum, and the rest he would sell or swap for others. One of the most important sources of specimens, which I've talked about in a previous film, was the Dundee whalers, whose voyages in the Arctic gave them access to all manner of creatures that could not be found elsewhere. Darcy quickly got to know the whaling captains, and later claimed they have always been the best friends of the museum. They brought back so many specimens for him that Darcy's museum was said to house possibly the finest collection of Arctic zoology in the world. This musk ox, for example, was gifted by Captain Robertson in 1897, and two years later Captain Milne of the Eclipse presented what Darcy hailed as a specimen unique in Britain of the very rare polyp Umbalula incrinus from Greenland. And as I've mentioned in my earlier film about Foraminifera, Darcy's work for the Scottish Fishery Board meant that he had his own research ship, the Gold Seeker, which allowed him to trawl for marine specimens around the Scottish and Irish coasts. Here are a couple of squat lobsters from Loch Fyne, for example, and some sea urchins from Roundstone Bay in County Galway. But Darcy also went on expeditions further afield. In 1893 he took his students on a trip to Norway, where he got to meet the explorer Nansen for the first time. Here's a starfish that he acquired in Bergen. Most ambitiously, in 1896 and 97, Darcy went on two epic voyages to the Bering Sea in the subarctic on behalf of the British government as part of an international inquiry into the declining population of fur seals. One of the places he visited there was Copper Island, where he acquired the semi-fossilised skeleton of the extinct Stellar's sea cow, described as a very rare trophy indeed and the most valuable and distinctive specimen of his collection. This is one of several Darcy specimens that are now in the collections of National Museum Scotland, and you can see a cast of it hanging in their natural history galleries. These journeys also took him to the USA, where he acquired the sea otter, 
Russia, this brown bear skull came from Kamchatka, and Japan, where he acquired this enormous spider crab from the fish market at Yokohama. Darcy's own collecting, however, accounted for just a small part of the museum's holdings, and he acquired many exhibits from professional taxidermists and natural history dealers such as Edward Gerard of London. It was Gerard who prepared the pair of Huya birds that I spoke about in a previous film, and among many other specimens he also sold Darcy this echidna skeleton for one pound and this eye eye for eight pounds. Gerard was also willing to swap specimens with Darcy. He provided a mountain tree shrew in exchange for one of Darcy's beluga whale embryos. Other regular suppliers included Vaclav Frick of Prague, who specialised in carefully prepared dissections like this one, showing the inside of a budgie. And Ward's natural science establishment of New Jersey, who sent this New Zealand lizard called a tuatara. Another important source was the live animal importer William Cross of Liverpool, who claimed to have the largest trading zoological establishment in the world. Darcy had written to Cross in 1885, asking him to let him know when any of his animals died, and Cross regularly gave Darcy first refusal. In 1897, for example, Cross wrote, I have a young male orangutan. It may die. If so, would you like to have it for five pounds? Well, budgets at the university being what they are, Darcy couldn't afford five pounds, but he did acquire many other specimens from Cross, including this chimpanzee, and also one gorilla in barrel, good for skeleton, but I think not for stuffing, 40 shillings, which is presumably this specimen at the front here, which is still one of our most popular exhibits today. Exchanges with other museums were also an important source of specimens. The British Museum sent Darcy a large collection of bird skins, many of which still have their original labels intact. They include some splendidly coloured tropical species, such as the purple-throated sunbird of Malaysia, the regent bowerbird from Australia, the yellow-backed sunbird from India, and the paradise tanager from Peru. The museum Godefroy in Hamburg sent a large selection of reptiles, including various snakes and lizards, while the Copenhagen Museum supplied specimens collected on the Danish Ingolf expedition, including rare sea urchins and sea spiders. And from the Naples Biological Station came another collection of marine invertebrates, such as sea cucumbers, feather stars and sea slugs. The huge Indian elephant skeleton that dominated the main hall of the museum had a very personal connection to Darcy, or at least so he believed. He had fond memories of visiting Dublin Zoo as a child, where he rode on the back of their famous elephant, Prince Tom, who had come to Britain in the 1870s after being presented to the Duke of Edinburgh on a visit to India. In 1891, Darcy heard from the zoo that their elephant had died, and he went out of his way to purchase it for the museum because of this childhood memory. Unfortunately, what Darcy didn't know was that Prince Tom had actually died back in 1882, and this was his replacement, called Rama. As far as I know, he never discovered the truth, but the real Prince Tom is now preserved in the Zoological Museum of Trinity College Dublin, while Rama is now in National Museum Scotland. Darcy also relied hugely on the generosity of individual collectors. Perhaps the most unusual of these was the wonderfully named Eliza Jelly. Miss Jelly was an expert on bryozoa, which are marine invertebrates that are sometimes called moss animals. They live together in colonies and look more like plants than animals. In 1894 she began posting, in numerous small batches, a selection from her bryozoan collection to Darcy, saying, I hope it may form a nucleus for the student of my favourite branch of study. Eventually, Darcy received over 800 specimens from her, and in return was able to supply her with a variety of specimens from his own expeditions. Miss Jelly devoted her entire life to researching bryozoa, and after the death of her brother she seems to have had no source of income. Darcy successfully petitioned the government to award her an annual pension of £20 a year, claiming that museums across the country were indebted to her skill, her industry and her generosity. Jelly wrote to Darcy, How shall I thank you and all those who are working with you for the exceeding kindness with which you are treating me, who merely worked her best, irrespective of health or strength? Well, there are many, many other individuals and institutions that helped add to Darcy's museum, and I've only had time to mention a few of the most significant ones here. 
Although much of the collection was lost or dispersed in the 1950s, we still have many thousands of specimens, revealing the amazing range of contacts that Darcy had around the world to help develop this extraordinary resource for Dundee. Well, that's all I have time for today. I hope you found that interesting, and join me for another film coming soon. Bye for now.